Can you hear me, Easton? Oh, I got you loud and clear. Gotcha. Well, listen, first off, I want to I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourself, but I want to say this real quick to everybody that's on this call, right? Um, when I came into this business, uh, Easton was somebody that get, Easton has get since day one has given me something to shoot for, right? He's given, he's given me something to chase. And I remember the first interview that I watched of him, um, talking about where he was from and you know, how, how bad he was whenever he started this business. I know a lot of people have, have heard that. And it really gave me hope. Uh, it, it really gave me hope and it gave me something to, to chase and something to go after. And I encourage everybody on this call to find somebody you may relate to um, and find somebody that's doing what you want to do and, and, and chase it, right? If, if, if you're trying to be successful in this business. And now um, I, I truly appreciate you coming on and taking time out of your day, you know, um, to do this. Uh, so real quick, uh, just for people who don't know, because we have a lot of new agents on here, Easton, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Yeah, of course. Well, thank, thanks a million for even thinking of me and, and having me on to share with you guys. You have a, a crazy, effective, growing team of extremely hardworking people. I love your guys' group. <clears throat> so to be asked to be on here is like, it's really cool for me because, um, you know, Gage and Kayla, you and, and Willis and, you know, a bunch of other the, the teammates that you guys have are like some of my favorite people in the company. So this is fun for me. So I started back in 2019 with uh, with the company. And before, like basically my whole life, I'd had mostly manual or physical labor jobs, roofing, landscaping, farming, ranching, a little bit of everything where you're kind of just moving heavy stuff around all day. You know, you're working 70, 80, 90 hours a week. Um, very draining and demanding work. So I got my first full-time job when I was 12. <clears throat> that summer was the first summer that I actually went to work for a different um, ranch. <clears throat> so I'd kind of done some stuff with my, my family's ranch before. And uh, I, I got into like this dirt biking stuff. <clears throat> and my dad was like, yeah, just so you know, I'm not paying for any of that stuff. So you need to get a job if you want to like, you know, do whatever you want to do with it. And so I started working for a local farmer with one of my buddies, 70 hours a week, five bucks an hour, and they were still taking out taxes. And I was like, well, that doesn't seem, you know, like the greatest uh, job in the world, but I've, I've been used to putting in a volume of hours since I was like a, a young kid. So this was no, you know, the hours thing and like, hey, you have to work really hard stuff was like, well, I've, I feel like I've already been, you know, working a crazy amount of hours at every other job I'd ever had. So the time part was really simple for me to understand because um, I'd got to watch, you know, somebody like my grandfather work, you know, he'd get up at 3.30 in the morning, go out, feed, come back, get his, you know, third, fourth, fifth cup of coffee and then get back after it. And he did that until his very last day on the planet, you know, so that's the kind of stuff that I grew up around. So I was pretty fortunate to be just surrounded by like a crazy hardworking family. So that's kind of like my background I did you know, do a little stint in corporate rental for a couple of years where it was my first like suit and tie, you know, washing cars, cleaning cars and like a nice suit kind of thing, customer service, a little bit of inside sales, um, but nothing like this. So this was like my very first intro into like being in charge of myself, which was a bit of an adjustment um, as it is for most people. Yeah, for sure. So um, when you first started, Right. <clears throat> when you first started, I, I know we've heard uh, the people that's been on this call has been around for a while. They've heard that you were bad. Right. That you were really, really bad. Um, but I, the for the new agents that are here and watching. Right. Um, and I've had a lot of them, uh, you know, uh, text me in the past two days because I knew you were going to be on this call. And the one thing that they they said to me was, can you ask him what what he believes uh, caused him to be so bad? in the beginning and what was the kind of aha moment that changed it? Well, I could take up the entire call, all the stuff that I screwed up. You know, I, I was quite literally the worst writing agent in the company my first like 90 days here for the volume that I was running. You know, I, I un once I understood that it was leads based and that you had to invest in yourself and go to work, I was not shy about investing in an obnoxious amount of leads every week 
And part of that became from straight up ego. You know, I, I came over here and I was coming from, you know, some, some success at my corporate job. So when I had saw the people that were absolutely crushing it here, I was like, dude, I'm going to murder this thing, you know? And so I had no doubt that this was going to be very easy for me. And I was like, dude, I can already do the work part. Like I'm so used to working a long week. What's the big deal? You know, I'll just, I'll just do that here. And I'm going to set everything on fire, help 400 families. My first year, no problem. I had no, no remote question that that's what I was going to do. So because of a little bit of like arrogance and overconfidence, it caused me to screw up a lot of stuff and like not want to reach out and implement, but reach out and then keep doing what I was doing on my own. So there's a ton of stuff that I was doing wrong from setting fake appointments to not caring about people at all. You know, I didn't come over here to like serve and help people. I came over here to get rich and throw it in everybody's face. That's what I was talking about at convention. Like that was very real for me. You know, I didn't care about anyone. You know, I was here for me and to prove to everybody that I was gonna do it and that I was capable of this and I was gonna do this stuff for me and mine, you know? And when you're sitting in front of a client and they they literally need our help and you have to be compassionate and empathetic, I didn't care, that was not my problem. My problem was I needed to get paid. And so when you go in with that mentality to the appointments, you're just gonna set yourself on fire in the worst way instead of the best way. And that's exactly what I did. You know, I was burning at both ends, not caring about people, rushing appointments, setting fake appointments. You know, when you go into to somebody's home and they're asking you to come and try to help them, and all I'm thinking about is how much money I'm going to make per sale on this person, dude, that's of course you're gonna do horribly because they can feel, they can literally feel it. And whether you think they can or not, I promise you they can. So when you're getting in front of people and you're not empathetic or compassionate, and you're not there for them, Dude, that's the kind of stuff that hurts you the most. And that was definitely my biggest problem early, which again, it goes back to me. You know, I had had a lot of conversations before I called Andrew. And when he said straight up, like, dude, if you can't care about people, you need to quit this job. You know, once I got over, like I was about to fly to Vegas and try to do massive physical harm to Andrew because I was so mad at him. I didn't understand why he would say that to me. You know, I was like, dude, I'm working literally as hard as I've ever worked in my entire life. And you just told me to quit. But the reason he said that is because when I was talking to him about how do I get rid of this commission breath stuff? His biggest takeaway from our conversation was this guy's calling me to complain because he doesn't care about anybody. And if I don't fix it, I'm going to bury myself in even more debt and go out of business anyway. So I better just get out now before it gets worse, you know, and that's why he said that to me. And again, it, 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 that was not something I got over overnight. You know, that took several months of trying to mentally understand why Andrew would say that to me. And it was one of the biggest blessings that I've that I've received as far as a coaching standpoint here, because it was a big eye opener. Hey, real quick, Easton, um, <clears throat> and then I got a follow up question on that. Can you describe fake appointments? Because I've I've actually had this conversation with you, uh, but there's yes. can you describe what you mean by a fake appointment? Fake appointments are the people that say I might possibly be home. Can you call me on your way? Because I'm not sure, and I put them on my calendar as a perfect set appointment. You know, that's that's how you drive yourself to the point of insanity in this business is someone says that they're probably not going to be home, but you're more than welcome to call them. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got a great appointment. I'm going to write it in my calendar. I've got 44 appointments in a week and I'm sitting in front of six. So that is a problem. And it's because so many of the appointments weren't actual appointments. I was just so excited. First of all, I wanted to look to the whole company like I was working hard. You know, because I, I was working hard, but nobody would know that if I didn't have a high appointment count. So I thought, dude, if I'm running 44 appointments, at least they know I'm trying. But really, I was running 16 appointments and the rest of them were fake ones in my in my calendar. You know, so that that's what a fake appointment is somebody that's like, I'm not interested. And you're like, sweet, I'll be there at six. And you write them down. That's not real. And you're just going to you're literally going to go insane if you do that to yourself a bunch. The first time I talked to you on the phone, you said, how many appointments do you run this week? And I said, 36. And he goes, no, no, no. or you go, no, 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 no. How many of those people actually knew you were coming over? And I was like, uh, eight. And he was like, that's a problem. And I was like, ah, I, I remember whenever you, whenever you said that. Um, I well, So everybody, so you talk about a lot, right? Um, it, it changed whenever you started actually caring about the clients that you sit with. But the one thing, the one thing that I want to ask you on that is, um, can, can you describe that more? Like actually caring about the client, right? Because, because yeah, you are, you are going to help clients and, and they did request the information. They did invite you to your house. So you're sitting at their kitchen table, right? So you're in that moment. 
right? So what what's the difference between caring, right, and caring and closing and pushing, you know, you know, challenging people, setting there? Because I think that a lot of people hear you say, well, I, I started caring about people, but what are the uncomfortable things you do uh, that 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 is caring about that person when you're sitting at their kitchen table? So the, the first part of that would be, I had to fix my calendar. So I had heard on a training like, hey, if you're running final expense appointments, be prepared, prepared for no shows. And so my takeaway from that was book 12 appointments between eight and five o'clock. Like that was my takeaway. I did, no, nobody said to do that. But my takeaway was I'm going to double book a bunch of appointments and including the fake ones. And I'm trying to like sit all these appointments in like a small seven, eight hour window or less when you need, I, I had a conversation with Mark Mead and I told him what my, you know, how I was running my calendar and it was like pretty embarrassing his response. So that was a huge adjustment. So instead of trying to go, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 with 10s double booked, 12s double booked, twos double booked, fives double booked, you know, and I just, I started getting like overwhelmed in the, in the home, like, oh my gosh, I got to get moving because I got to get to my next one. You know, and so I'm four or five, six minutes into these appointments and I'm like starting to jot down prices. I have no idea why I'm even, I'm even in the house. So moving my schedule to every hour and 15 minutes or every hour and a half at first gave me quality time to sit down and say, OK, if I'm sitting in front of my parents, how what kind of a conversation would I have about with them about what's going to happen? My dad's working full time. My mom is is stay at home mom trying to raise three hellions you know, while my dad's making the money. And if I'm sitting in that situation, what kind of questions do I need to ask? Like, what happens if you don't come home tomorrow? Like, what does my mom do for income? Where do they live? Because now the bills are, are start piling up. Then maybe you've got some work life insurance that covers, you know, one to two years of income. I understand that after that money is gone, what do you guys do? Where do you go? Where do you live? How do you feed the kids? My mom's gonna go back to work part-time and then hire a sitter to take care of the kids. So that's an expense and she's only working part. Like there's no way you can stay in the home. And there's no way that like, even if it's a final expense or an internet appointment, if let's say that they're 70 and that person passes away, what do your kids do for work? Like walk me through that. So now you've got a daughter who's a single mom with three kids working two different jobs. How is she going to come up with 10, 15, 20 grand overnight? Or is that why I'm over here? Like, can you explain to me and walk me through what that's like for her to fly out, take time off, pay for all your stuff and your debt because you didn't want to pay 50, 60, 70, 80 bucks a month and having that real conversation with them and having them explain to you, well, there's, there's literally no way that they could ever afford to do that. Okay. I'm assuming that that's why I'm here. Is that fair? You know, and just being real with them and like present and empathetic, like I, I care about what happens to your daughter. So that's why I'm so passionate about finding something that fits you and fits your budget, because without this, they are the ones that have to pay the price when you're not here. And I'm assuming that you actually care about your grandkids and your daughter, which well, that'd be weird if they didn't, because I'm over there for insurance. So just trying to create the most real situation possible, getting uncomfortable, asking 10 minutes of why questions and just being present because I didn't know how to do that at first because I was there for a check and so I didn't care. So if you can make that adjustment to like, hey, if you're not around tomorrow, what does your daughter do for work? Where does she live? You know, how many kids does she have? Is she single, married? You know, what's the situation? Most average American families to come up with five grand overnight is a massive burden. Now you're talking about five, 10, 15 plus and they're missing work and they're traveling. Like there's so many things that can happen that that's a massive expense. You just gotta ask. And I, I used to get frustrated because I was like, I don't know what questions to ask. They're like, dude, what do you, how do you not know what questions? Why don't you just like be a real person when you're in there? Like ask them what happens without it. What does she do? How does she come up with that money? Where does she find it? How does that impact their family long-term? There's so many bad things that can happen even without like a small $5,000 policy. If that doesn't get paid out, Dude, that hurts the family more than just five grand. You're talking about food, rent, all that other stuff that comes into a family equation that they don't have money for because you didn't want to take care of it. And having that real conversation with them is kind of what helped change the trajectory of my career here. Gotcha. So, uh, man, that's that's really good knowledge. Um, 
because with a new agent, right? With, when you have a new agent asking some of those questions, it's not just you go into that home and you sit at the table and you're looking at prices, right? And you know, you you got to paint that picture. I I feel like um, I feel like learning from people like you um, early on to paint that picture uh, is is what truly helped me on on my final expense appointments because. Um, sometimes they, they would live in an area where their family were a thousand miles away, right? And all they want, they, they just wanted extra coverage so that they could fly their family there, right? Yep. Um, so, real, so real quick, the, the next thing that I wanted to ask you about was um, your schedule, right? Because when you're booking that many appointments, man, that's, that's, that, that's a ton of appointments. But you're, the schedule, right? Can you hit on the schedule for somebody that might be struggling with um, you know, how, how they set up, set up their time, their dial time. Cause I know we talk about Monday and Thursday, but what happens on Monday, right? When you don't book enough appointments, right? What happens on Monday when you don't book enough appointments? Can you talk about your schedule throughout the week? So I think there's a massive confusion that because we have scheduled dial days, that that's the only day you can dial. Like if your schedule is not full, every single day is an income producing activity day, which means every day is a dial day until you're you know, you kind of learn enough of a, of a dial skill set to book a full schedule. So my, my Mondays and Thursdays was always my primary dial day. But if I was getting killed on the phone where I've got 50, you know, brand new final expense leads that I had ordered four or five days in advance and I set eight of them and it's four and four, like, do you know how much time you have to either dial or get in front of people? So my whole goal was to see what kind of activity can I do to try to force an additional sit because at the end of the day like i was i was really desperate to try to figure this thing out i mean i was having you know a couple of credit cards were already turned off you know within just a few short weeks of trying this thing because i was reckless with trying to understand how to do the business you know you already don't have any money and now and now you're putting stuff on credit cards to try to fund your business early and then you're not compassionate you're not setting the full calendar i was very intense with having my first month. It was a seven day a week op because um, I'm in charge of myself and I'm running my own business and I needed to make money. You know, there, that was at the end of the day, like I needed to make sure that I was going to be okay financially because I had already over promised to so many people that I was going to murder this thing uh, selfishly that how could I possibly tell them that I was getting killed? You know, so my first 90 days, I worked every single day. I didn't take any days off that first 90 days. And it was dial Monday, run as many appointments Tuesday and Wednesday as I could. But in between appointments, I was door knocking as many people as I could trying to get a same day sit or a same day schedule or a next day schedule because I had so much time on my calendar open. So bringing, bringing a calendar with me and a run notebook with me to be able to take notes on my mistakes and then fill as many gaps in my schedule as I possibly could. I was always on the move. Um, and again, I didn't take any days off and I understand everybody's situation is different, but if you're in a desperate situation and your family's in a bad spot, that's your responsibility to work. And since I was so accustomed to the working stuff, I did tell Lindsay right out of the gate, I was like, you gotta give me 90 days to run at this thing full blast as hard as I can. Because I, I actually don't know what I'm doing, believe it or not, because I've never done this before. I've never done insurance. I've never contracted. I've never ran a business on my own. So you just got to give me 90 days. I was like, if I can learn how to do this in 90 days, we're going to be so rich. It's going to be unbelievable. You know, that was my mentality. And so as I'm like failing and failing and failing and failing and I'm going under and I'm racking up credit card debt and, you know, I'd finally help someone for, you know, uh, a, a small policy and then you know two days later they would get rid of it because they i didn't have any idea where they got it in the first place that kind of stuff was really emotional for me like it was this wild roller coaster and it wasn't even a roller coaster because i didn't have any ups it was just all downs you know because I, I wasn't having any success i was having enough success to clear 500 bucks on my credit card out so that i could buy 500 dollars more leads you know i didn't have people talk about the ups and downs i was just downs all of it was down you know so i was like it's something has got to change what could I possibly be doing wrong? I'm working a lot of hours, you know, I was kind of going through all these different emotions, but I truly don't think I was really having any ups until my 10th week. And I just kind of all this training and learning and coaching and mentoring, I can't remember who specifically had the conversation with me, but they said, dude, you're already not selling anything. So what do you have to lose by listening? Like you're already at zero. 
you know, you're already under, you're already not helping anybody. So if that's your situation, you, you have nothing else to lose. Like you're upside down. You can't do You can't sell because that's what it was for me is selling. It wasn't service. It was selling. And if I'm not selling, why not just try to take some advice and slow down a little bit, ask some hard questions, run a more structured schedule every hour and 15 minutes, have an appointment, give yourself enough time to do a good job and love the person that you're with. You know, that's, one thing that this the reason my schedule had to get changed structurally is because i would be in an appointment and finally having a quality sit and i was like oh my gosh i got to be at my next one in 15 minutes it's 30 minutes across town i would skip to the end hey this one's 60 bucks are you guys good with that and they're like well i don't understand what just happened here like why are we on price i don't we didn't do any of the other stuff <clears throat> so my schedule not to get off track too far sorry about that um, it was a 90 day relentless every single day, 12, 13, 15 hours a day, whatever it took. I door knocked every single Sunday until the sun went down. Um, and sometimes after just trying to get in front of somebody that I thought I could potentially help. Um, and once it went from selling to helping and serving instead of getting paid, the money came eventually because I made that mental adjustment from, I need to sell to let me just see if, what they need and how I can help. Um, but it, it has to be crazy structured and you have to go at this thing like a freight train when you're new because you don't know what you're doing. And it's okay if you don't know what you're doing, but you have to be coachable and willing to, to actually implement some of the stuff that you're learning. You know, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the schedule and being structured and disciplined on it, that was the thing that I fought. I fought it. I, I fought it so hard. And um, I remember I talked to, uh, I, I talked to you one time about it um, and you just told me, you were like, you got to go to that last appointment. Like it doesn't matter. Like if you're sitting with somebody and it runs over, like you have to go to that last appointment at night. You have to, and like there, there you you just gave it no option. You're so <laughs> it, now I find myself, you know, sometimes eight thirty, eight forty five at night, and I roll up into someone's driveway and they're like, "Come on in," you know, and I, I'm an hour and a half late, right? Because I've been sitting with people all day, and that that little th I fought that. You you told me that probably four months ago, and I fought that so much. I fought that so much. And when I finally started doing it, um, it, it was completely different. It, uh, it was completely different because if they, if they sat with me at eight 30 at night at the kitchen table, they needed help and they wanted help and they wanted me to help them. Right. You know what's so crazy about that Cody is because when you start learning some of the skill set and you start actually getting better at what we're supposed to be doing, which is serving, I've had people say, Hey, I didn't go to my eight 30 cause I was good. Like, <laughs> Dude, that is so crazy. Uh, not go to an appointment that asks you to come and help them because you had had a good day. Like, what a crazy way to think. Um, like, they're, they're, we could be the last line of defense. Like, if tomorrow's it and you skip your 830 and something happens, that's on you for life because you didn't show up. And they're counting on you to show up to prevent the worst case scenario. And that's them passing or getting sick or having a medication change because they got sick. And now they're ineligible for something that could truly have helped them. So getting out of your own way, even when you start to win, you can't skip appointments just because, hey, I'm comfortable. I had a big day. I helped all these people. I'm good. Like, dude, the, the 7, 30, 8, 30, 9 p.m. people, they still need you. That's why they're waiting for you to come over. So that's whether you're doing well or getting killed, you still have to show up. Yeah, no, I fought it. I fought it. And I, I say that a lot now. Just show up. Like, just just show up. It doesn't matter. Just show up. But I did for months. I fought that, you know, because that, that that was my mentality. I'm good. I'm good. Right. Um, and it wasn't until you just basically told me I was <laughs> being like you, you were like, dude, you're lazy and you don't really like you're, you you got to go to that last appointment, man. Like, why would you not? Like you, you booked the appointment. Why would you not go to it? You have time. What are you going to do? Go home and go to sleep, go to the hotel, go to sleep. It's not yeah. about you know what I mean. Like it's it. If you're only here for you, you're going to struggle eventually. Like it can't always be about, you know, what I can get. And I think if you just make that big service mentality adjustment, all of a sudden you're, you're so much more capable of what you think and you can help so many more people. If you'll get out of your own way, um, whether you're doing good or bad, uh, you have to be willing to make a little bit of a sacrifice and that's typically time. Well, the, so the journey is always, I mean, that's it, right? It's the, it, the journey, getting up every day, going, going to your first appointment on time, going to your last appointment on time, 
you know, door knocking the whole nine yards, helping everybody that you possibly can, putting the time and effort into it. And, you know, that that's what, it, you know, that's the journey, especially when it comes to building a business to help more people, right? But if Easton could go back and tell 2019 Easton self, like if you could, if you could peek in on Easton back then when you first started that first week of you running business, what are the two main, like, what are the two main pieces of advice that you would give Easton back then? Dude, I would punch myself in the face my very first day. <laughs> hey, dude, you are literally here for the wrong reasons. So let me help save you a ton of financial and emotional stress. And you have to be here to help people because especially when you're already coming from like a not super stable financial spot, everybody is here to get paid. And I, I understand that because it's a, you know, it's a job, career, business, whatever you want to call it. Like we still need to be able to support ourselves. Right. But if that's, if that's such a big distraction that you forget on why we're out selling life insurance, I think it's going to be really hard to actually get over the hump. So I would tell myself, like, first of all, you need to adjust why you're doing this, you know, and, and if, and if I could make that adjustment way earlier, um, I don't know what would have happened if I could have like came out and been really successful early. I think that built so much passion for what we do and it allowed me to, you know, kind of learn about myself a lot more than I ever would have thought of. So I'm glad I went through it. I certainly wish it was not going to be that long. That was a pretty long stretch to be so horrible. Um, but I would say, dude, you've got to care about people when you, when you get into this career path. And then secondly, I would have said, can you please just relax when you're in front of people? Like stop trying to be such a salesperson, like go in and have a conversation with them. And instead of trying to like memorize exactly what to say, each specific sentence, like I need to say this word and then I need to say this paragraph and then I need to say this sentence. Instead of doing that, just go in there and introduce yourself and sit down and have a conversation with them. Like relax a little bit, dude. It's they're they're not wanting the sales guy to come over and that's what you're trying to do. And you're gonna hurt yourself uh, really bad financially early if you don't actually just calm down. You know, trying to press through all these fake appointments and even some real ones when I finally get in front of someone, you need to just have a conversation. Like, yes, Jeremy's right on the spot, dude. Be authentic with people, be compassionate. Like that part is so important. So I would just tell myself to calm down. I would have changed my schedule to an hour and 15 minutes day one. And I would just say, just go in there and talk to them like they're your family or somebody that you care more about than anybody in the world. You know, and if you can do that, put yourself, because every this is one thing that I learned, dude, everybody has been through some pretty crazy emotional hardships. They've lost people. They've had people close to them get sick. I mean, everybody has experienced something. So if you knew that that was gonna happen to the person you were sitting in front of, what kind of a conversation would you have with them if tomorrow was their last day and you knew it, whether it's sickness or death, what kind of a conversation would you have with them? Like how much passion would you bring to the table? You need to start treating every single appointment like tomorrow's the last day. Um, and, in the, and in the rare exception that we get into somebody who's actually fairly adequately insured, because you know, not that we see a ton of them, but like, you don't need to try to force anything. Just say, hey, it's weird that we're both here. I have no idea why I'm at your house. Were you looking for something specific? Because you guys have a butt ton of insurance, like a ton. So what else, what am I missing here? Like, what do you think you actually need? With, with the exception of that rare circumstance, like just be compassionate, dude, and be yourself. Stop trying to be everybody else. Like you're gonna do this job and work 80 hours a week at it and try to be someone else. Isn't that gonna be a very long career for you to behave like that? Just be yourself, be empathetic and compassionate. And I think that's the some big things that I would have fixed early. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so I'm gonna let you go here in just a minute, but today, is obviously dial day right so if you can leave um we do have a lot of people who do telesales right um but if you could leave people with uh your two best dial day tips real quick on when dial day gets tough and that and like it gets in your head right what's your go-to thought what's your go-to what keeps you going to keep dialing the phone and keep calling people so the kidnapped child example is like a really funny one to talk about. Like how much would you guys dial if they took the person that you love the most and they literally stole them and kidnapped them? How frequently do you think you would call them to get your kid back? That's something that I did here, you know, second or third month in that I was like, well, that's a, that's a great mentality. And it keeps you super emotionless on 
What if this person gets mad after the third dial? What if they say, hey, I'm going to be home tomorrow at two. Can you come over then? Like, why does it always have to be what if something bad happens? Why not? What if something good happens and make a little mental shift there? Um, treating each lead like they're an actual family and a human being and a person that needs your help. Um, you have to stay emotionless on dial day. You can't get wound up or frustrated or punch stuff. Um, you know, everybody gets frustrated on dial day because you're like, I know you guys filled it out. I'm looking at all the information. I know you sent this stuff in. So why are they fibbing to me about they didn't do it? You know, maybe they had a bad experience with an agent or somebody wrote them a terrible policy on a family member that didn't pay out because it was graded and they had no idea. You never know what someone could be having a bad day, a bad experience. There's so many factors that go into why they're reacting like that. So it's not your fault and you don't, you don't need to treat them like that. You know, don't get frustrated or upset. Just show up at their house. Just go over there. You know, if you've got a gap or you get no show to rescheduled, just go over to their house and see how you can help them. Because when you show up in front of them, they're not going to be seven foot three and try to hit you with a club. You know, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I have no idea that it was actually for this. Like, come on in. Um, you know, so just you have to stay locked in mentally on dial day because this treat it like a, the $10 million opportunity that it is. We have an, an opportunity here to build something that's going to change lives, change the lives of people around us and change our family forever. You get, you have six hours of bad dials and you're going to literally throw away and flush this opportunity down the toilet because you're emotionally upset and emotionally charged. Like this is something that legitimately will change your life because I've not only experienced it, but I've watched other people change their lives that, that I have helped bring on. And that's the power, dude. You, you start bringing people that you care about on and watch it physically change how they think, how they act, what their financial life looks like. Like that's so powerful. So you have four, five, six bad hours of dialing and you're just gonna throw it all away and become so crazy emotional. You're like, maybe I'm gonna quit. Maybe I'm gonna do this or do that. I don't know how people do this. This doesn't seem real. Like, dude, it's sick. We're six hours in, relax. You know, you've got, nobody ever came onto something with no experience and just knocked it out of the park and made $10 million, you know? And if, if you can just adjust your mindset, like this is the biggest opportunity you're ever gonna have that can change your life. You don't need to be emotional about it. I'm not saying you don't need to get frustrated. I can't, you're gonna get frustrated. I can't help that part, but you can't overreact and say, maybe this isn't for me, especially your first few weeks. Like you're not supposed to know what you're doing. That's what, that's what all the mentors are for and your managers. Like they're there to help you. Just call them and ask for help. People are really weird about reaching out for help because they feel like they're bothering me. Oh, you're busy. Dude, everybody's busy. And when when Zach was busy and John was busy and Dom was like, all the people that I called were busy. And when I said, dude, I'm, I'm working, you know, 70, 80, 90 hours a week, I just need some help. They were willing to help me when they had a lot more stuff going on than another crappy agent coming on to complain. So if you're working really hard and you're calling to get actual structured advice and change, like reach out for help. Like that's what our job is, is to help you guys so that you don't have to go through what I went through. Cause that was the worst three months of my entire life from an emotional standpoint where I was so unbelievably stressed that I thought I was going to ruin, you know, my now wife's life because I took a risk to do something that I was passionate about. I thought I could figure out without actually caring about humans. Um, so I don't know if that was kind of what you were. No, looking. that's no, that's that. No, that's great, man. Because I mean, dial days where it's kind of make or break, you know. And whenever you have, like, when you take the lumps, you know, and you get hit, and you're just you feel like beating your head off the side of the table, you know, while you're sitting there, uh, it's really important to find something, find something that takes the emotion out of it. That's what to, that's what I've always taken from top producers on dial day. And I'm glad that you said that. We got a bunch of new agents on here and I really wanted them to hear that. Um, but listen, man, I appreciate your time so much because you are busy and you do help a ton of families and you have taught so many people. And, but the one thing I want you to know, man, is I truly appreciate it because you, you're you're one of those that you've paid, you paved the way, man, and you give you give uh, you give something to chase, and I truly appreciate it, man. If uh, you know, if someone asked me who's the most selfless in this company, I would say Easton Padden, because he always gives back, always gives back, man. So, I just want to leave you guys with the the self doubt piece, right? Everybody's going to go through a little bit of it, but I truly think people are so much more capable than they have any idea. Like, what are you willing to give up for a small window of time? to really get back what you're looking for. 
And what you'll find as you kind of go through these, you know, this roller coaster and this learning curve is what's on the other side is so insane. And we have not literally even started yet. Like I haven't even been here three years yet. So I'm like, just getting warmed up. Dude, this is like, a, I could do this for 20 years because I, I truly love it. And I love working with people like you um, that, that I've got to watch change your life coming from the background that you did and the stuff that you went through. That's what means the most to me. That's why I love getting on the phone with people because getting to watch what's happened in your life as, is a great example, Cody, and, and how you changed your life and the impact that you've had on other people. Dude, that's what this whole thing is about. You know, and, and in my opinion, if Sean can still work 90 plus hours a week, like I don't have an excuse, bro. So that's kind of like the mental <laughs> every day. Well, listen, man, I appreciate it. Thanks for hopping on. Thanks for hopping on, man. I appreciate it. That's uh, that's gold. If you ever need anything, you let us know. I know we all appreciate it. Okay, bro. You guys are the best. You have a great rest of your dial. They crush it. Yep. Yep. See you, Easton. <laughs>